Hi there. Uh, welcome back. This is lecture five of machine learning from data where we're going to be begin our discussion of training versus testing. Basic question. Does E out approximately equal E in when you're learning with an infinite hypothesis set? Okay. And, uh, you know, this is a nice lecture because at the end I'm going to give you a combinatorial puzzle to work on. So stay tuned. But first, let's talk about uh, where we were from last time. Okay. So last time we discussed the feasibility of learning and, and we boiled it down to, to two basic uh, steps. The first step is, can you ensure that E out for G, the final hypothesis from learning, is close to E in of G? And if so, then you've established the first step of learning. And then the second step is, go and check, is, is E in of G small enough? Okay, and if you can get both of those to work, then you have you can conclude that E out is, is low, and then you've learned G is approximately equal to F. Now, to help us with the first step, you know, we, we, we have this uh, Huffing bound, and we generalize the Huffing bound to the case of a finite hypothesis set, and it says that when you choose G, the E out of G is, you know, linked to E in of G by the generalization error bar. And this generalization error bar basically depends on the square root of, you know, the logarithm of the number of hypotheses divided by the size of the data set. Okay. And then there's this trade-off, which says that as you choose a, a larger and larger hypothesis set, then you know, you'll get lower and lower in sample error, but you'll pay a price. And this price is the price of, that you pay for having the, uh, the flexibility to choose the hypothesis set from a larger and larger set. And this price, you can think of it as a model complexity price. Okay, and when you add these two, that's when you get this bound for E out. And this purple curve is, is sort of heuristically showing this bound. And you can see that it has a U-shape, which means, you know, that th 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 there's some optimal you know, hypothesis set size, and this is the size that you should pick. It depends on the number of data points, and of course, um, you know, it depends on the nature of, of the problem, which is how does E in drop as you increase the size of the hypothesis set. You can think of E in, you know, as you're training, you know, to, to take a final exam, and you have a practice exam, and E in is, you know, you know how you, you, you perform on the practice exam, and why is that not you know, why is it, why is it a, a tricky situation there? Because, you know, you might memorize the practice exam. You might, you know, focus on, you know, training only what you need for the practice exam. That's kind of like, you know, the learning algorithm might pick a final hypothesis G that's only focusing on the data set. Okay, but what really matters is when we come to test you with the final exam. Okay, so that's this issue of training versus testing. Okay, now we're going to embark on the theory of generalization. And what is the theory of generalization going to accomplish? Well, let's, let's put on the top here, you know, what we accomplished with finite hypothesis sets. And the theory of generalization is going to essentially tell us the same thing, almost, there are going to be some subtleties, but it's almost going to tell us the same thing for infinite hypothesis sets. So, in other words, we're still going to try to get a bound of the form E out of G. Now, where G is coming from learning, out of an infinite hypothesis set. So E out is linked to E in by an error bar. And the error bar looks very similar to the error bar for finite hypothesis sets, you know, which is the top row. Uh, so some slight changes in constants, you know, so the one over two becomes eight in bold here, the two becomes four. And, the, and then the main change is that we're gonna have to give up this notion of the size of the hypothesis set as a way to measure the model complexity and replace it with something that's a little bit more efficient. That's a, that, that, that sort of uh, estimates the true complexity of the hypothesis set more carefully. Size is a kind of a, 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 a rough estimate of how complex is a, is a hypothesis set. Okay, so this new bound is going to be applicable to infinite h. And that means that we can implement our two-step process with infinite h with a theoretical guarantee for the first step that e out is close to e g. Okay, now What's going to allow us to do this? Because, you know, you know, when you go back to how we proved, you know, the, 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 the generalization of the Hafting bound for finite in many hypotheses, there was one fundamental uh, thing that came into play, which was this union bound that said that, you know, G comes from the hypothesis set H. And if a bad thing happens for G, then it means that a bad thing must happen for one of the H's. And, and, and to bound that probability, we take the union bound, the or. So we say that, you know, a bad thing for H1 plus a bad thing for H2 plus a bad thing for H3 and so on. So the union bound was instrumental in getting us the, the Hafting bound that's on the top here. Okay. But we can't apply the union bound with infinitely many things. So we have to fundamentally uh, change the theory in such a way that we might be able to apply some related uh, probabilistic bounds. Okay. And so here's the basic idea. The basic idea is that the size of the hypothesis set is overkill. Now to, to sort of, you know, to show that to you in a very trivial way, consider a hypothesis set 
which consists of all hypotheses that are the same. So you have H1, 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 H1 M times. Okay. Now, in this case, G is basically, is basically restricted to H1. So it's effectively a hypothesis set of size 1. Okay, but when you just look at the size, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. It's M. Okay. And, you know, the bad event that occurs for G is when its E out is far from its E in. And, you know, that was the sum of the bad events for each of the hypotheses. But, you know, if the bad event occurs for one of the hypotheses, it, it occurs for all the hypotheses in this hypothesis set because they're all the same. Okay, so there's a huge overlap. There's a huge intersection in when the bad events occur in the hypothesis set. Now, my argument, you know, uh, remains r roughly the same if instead of identical hypotheses, we replace the hypothesis H1 with something very close to H1 and then something very close to that and something very close to that. So the hypotheses are technically different, but practically they may basically be the same hypothesis. They might only differ out, in infi out at infinity, for example. Okay. So what that means is that when a bad event occurs for one hypothesis, it will simultaneously be a bad event for all the hypotheses. Okay. And so uh, the probability that a bad event occurs for, you know, one or the other or the other is essentially the same as the probability that it occurs for one. And so we, we don't really need to multiply by the size of the hypothesis set. And that's captured by this picture here, which, so, which shows the bad events. You know, so the green circle is the bad event for hypothesis one. The blue circle is the bad event for hypothesis two. The red circle is the bad event for hypothesis three, and so on and so forth. And now we want to take the, the union bound says, I'm going to bound the size of the union by the sum of the sizes. Well, in this case, it's clear that the size of the union is much less than the sum of the sizes. Okay. So the bottom line is, that the size of the hypothesis set is definitely a measure of its complexity, but it can be a gross overestimate when the hypotheses are very similar. Okay. And so we want a measure of the size of a, hypo a hypothesis set, or effectively its complexity, that can capture the similarity between the hypotheses in it. In particular, if every hypothesis is basically the same, then the effective size is close to 1, not close to infinity. And here's the idea, and that's what we're going to flesh out today. Okay. We need a way to measure not just the size of the hypothesis set, but also its diversity. So let's play along with an experiment. Okay. Fix any number of data points you want, let's say n. Now, in theory, if you have a hypothesis set with 50 hypotheses, then it should be able to you know, implement uh, 50 different ways to classify that uh, data set of size n. And if it's not a very diverse hypothesis set, it won't be able to implement all 50 ways to, imp uh, to classify that data set. Okay. So the, the, the real insight here is not to specifically count how many hypotheses you have, but to count the number of ways the hypothesis can classify your data set okay, for some fixed data set. And I'm going to illustrate that in a, in a sort of a cartoon experiment here that we're going to play, you know, and I can do this, uh, you know, with my slides. And so, you know, uh, uh, bear in mind that, you know, this may not re uh, re represent reality totally, but imagine a hypothesis set that looks something like this. So this is sort of, you know, a collection of perceptrons, okay, where I'm, I'm imagining that all these perceptrons are all different lines and, you know, the, the top right is plus one and the bottom left is minus one. Okay. Now, Looks like a very complicated hypothesis set. Lots of different perceptrons. And if we count it, it's probably about 20, who knows. Okay. But now what, what, what this idea that we are sort of nurturing here is that, you know, let's not measure the complexity of the hypothesis set by the number of hypotheses. Let's consider what it can do on a data set. So let's generate a data set. Okay. So on the right, I've now generated a data set of data points. Okay. Nice. So this is a data set of, you know, approximately nine data points. Okay, and we've got all these hypotheses, and now we can ask, well, 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 well okay, now, you know, if I pick one of the hypotheses, it, it, it's going to classify the data in one particular way. If I pick another hypothesis, it, it's going to classify the data in another particular way, and, and so on and so forth. But, wait a minute, all the hypotheses in this hypothesis set are going to classify that data set in exactly the same way. No matter what hypothesis I pick from this collection of hypotheses, all the top right data points are going to be blue and all the bottom left data points are going to be red. Okay, so now here is the punchline. 
Now, viewed through the lens of this particular data set, okay, viewed through the lens of this particular data set, that hypothesis set on the left, which has all these hypotheses, is effectively just one hypothesis. Okay, so I'm going to let that sink in. All those hypotheses there, with respect to what they can do on this data set, basically collapses to just one hypothesis. Now, isn't that interesting? Okay. So, while I might have, in fact, there are infinitely many hypotheses that I could have, you know, shown on the left, and then they would all collapse to one hypothesis on this data set. Okay. And we are going to now develop a measure of complexity for a hypothesis set that can take that into account. Okay. And you can think of it as an effective number of hypotheses. Okay. So, you know, the size of H only captures the maximum possible diversity and it's overkill. Okay. But we are going to now look for a, a way to also capture the diversity in the hypothesis set. Okay. And if a hypothesis set is very diverse, it should be able to implement many different ways to classify any particular data set. And we, we, we call the ways in which you can classify a data set uh, the dichotomies. Okay, and if you if you cannot classify a data set in many ways, then it's not a very sophisticated, it's not a very diverse hypothesis set. Okay. And we're going to introduce this concept of the growth function, which is going to quantify exactly this. And that is going to end up being um, a, a better measure of complexity for a hypothesis set. And it turns out that that measure of complexity is going to be uh, useful in deriving this this generalization bound that links E out to E in for infinite hypotheses. Okay, now, you know, we're going to move to the board because A, this is an important topic. I need to go slow and the board is always better for math related stuff. Okay, so we're going to develop the growth function. It's a measure of complexity for a hypothesis set that's not as crude as the number of hypotheses it contains. The size, that's very crude. It tends to be overkill. It doesn't capture diversity. Okay, so you know you can you can think of the growth function as an effective number of hypotheses. The, the 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 sort of key insight, the key idea, is to view a hypothesis set through the lens of a particular data set. Okay, because at the end of the day, we don't apply hypothesis sets in in the abstract setting on the whole input space. We apply it to data. Okay. All right. So let me show you an example. Okay, and you know let's be concrete in two dimensions. You know, consider three data points. Okay, and let us consider a hypothesis similar to the credit approval hypothesis, let's say, and let me call this, you know, H or H1. Okay, um, and, you know, plus, plus, minus, so I'll label this guy plus, and I'll label these two guys minus. Okay, and here I'm illustrating that a hypothesis, a classifier, for example, in two dimensions or any, any number of dimensions, you know, it, it, it separates out your space into two regions, okay, the plus region and the minus region. And so if you're given any set of points, okay, then it'll, it'll assign to some of those points minus one and to some of those points plus one. And so that's what a classifier does. Okay. And now I want to mention that, okay, here, uh, we, let's label these points x1, you know, x2, x3. Okay. These are just points. So this discussion has nothing to do whatsoever with the target function. It has nothing to do with the y values in a data set. Just think of these as three arbitrary points that I have picked. Okay. I'm just trying to analyze a hypothesis set. I've, I've, I've not brought in you know, the, the data set that we, we get from machine learning. So these are just three abstract points that I picked. Okay. Now on these, three ab on, on these three abstract points, we say that the hypothesis H1 implements the dichotomy so let me label the, the I label the points x1 x2 x3 okay so we say that the hypothesis h1 implements the dichotomy minus plus minus so minus plus minus okay and so this is called a dichotomy okay. why dichotomy because it, it, it so this hypothesis dichotomizes the data set into you know, two different sets, one which we have labeled, you know, minus and one which we have labeled plus. So two different subsets. Okay. And, you know, now let's, let's make the leap to a hypothesis set, okay, which is a whole bunch of different hypotheses. 
Okay, who knows how many? So you have hypothesis set H with maybe H1, H2, H3, H4, all the way up to maybe H400. I don't know, okay, just an example. Okay. Now this second hypothesis is different. Okay, what does that mean? That means that, you know, on the space, the regions it assigns plus and minus two are different. They may be very different or only slightly different, but okay, whatever the difference between these two hypotheses, we can still, we can certainly, you know, evaluate the hypothesis H2 on the same data set. Okay, and maybe we get minus, minus, minus. Okay, fine, that's a different dichotomy, no surprise, because it's a different hypothesis. Okay. And, you know, let's, let's see what H3 says. Okay, H3 might say plus, 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 and H4 might say, you know, minus, minus, plus, and so on. Okay, so, the, the entire hypothesis set, when viewed through this uh, collection of points x1, x2, x3, implements a set of dichotomies. Okay. Now, um, sooner or later, you know, maybe let's say h9, okay, sooner or later, for example, once we hit h9, one of these dichotomies is going to have to repeat. Okay, so for example, H9 might implement, you know, minus, plus, minus, again. Okay, now we look at this and say, oh, interesting, okay. You know, does that mean H9 is the same hypothesis as H1? No, it's a different hypothesis. It's just that on, 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 on these three data points, these two hypotheses agree. And indeed, okay, it is, it, it's an easy counting argument to see that there can be at most eight different dichotomies that appear in this table. A dichotomy is a row, there can be at most eight different rows. Now why is that? Because you can classify x1 in two ways, okay, times the two ways that you can classify x2, times the two ways you can classify x3. So that there are only eight different ways in which you can classify these three points. And you know, that doesn't matter whether you're classifying in some abstract setting or you're classifying using hypotheses. Okay, there are just eight different dichotomies. Okay, so that's an important observation. There are just eight different dichotomies that can appear in this table. Okay, now let's completely generalize this discussion and now talk about an arbitrary hypothesis set and an arbitrary set of endpoints x1 to xn. Okay, so now we can have an arbitrary hypothesis set H and, you know, we can list its hypotheses. So H has hypotheses H1, H2, and so on. And now the fact that I'm listing it, you know, don't get hung up on that fact. We don't, we don't require that the hypothesis set be finite. We don't require that it be countable. It's just, you know, just listing examples of hypotheses here and here I have n data points x1, x2, x3, up to xn. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, I'm completely generalizing and this is n data points and they can be in any number of dimensions. Okay, and once again, you know, each of these hypotheses in my arbitrary hypothesis set, you know, for this data set is going to assign a set of plus or minus ones. For example, minus, minus, plus, da, 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 plus, whatever. Okay. So this is dichotomy one, okay, and you know maybe minus 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 everything minus dichotomy two, and so. On. Okay. Now clearly, if my hypothesis set is infinite, I'm not going to be able to create this table. But one thing I know for sure is that that only a finite number of different rows can appear in this table. In fact, I can give an explicit upper bound. 2 to the n. There can be at most 2 to the n different rows. Okay. So let us define the hypothesis set H restricted to the data points x1 to xn. So we're going to define the restriction of the hypothesis set H to the points x1, x2, up to xn. Okay. And, you know, this discussion basically captures what I'm about to define. Okay, so h of x1, x2, x3, up to xn is just the set of dichotomies that are implemented by hypotheses in h on the data set, on the, on the set of points x1 to xn. So it's 
The dichotomy, so if I, if I want to define it formally, it's the dichotomy is delta such that delta is implemented by some hypothesis H in H. Okay. So we will use the, 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 the label delta for a dichotomy. Okay. Mm. okay. Now, important observation. Okay, so this is the restriction of H to a data set. So you can think of this as we are viewing the hypothesis set H through the lens of this uh, set of points X1 to Xn. Okay. And the hypothesis set H is arbitrary. It can be uncountably infinite, but we don't care. Okay. It still implies that this set of dichotomies is finite and now you can start to see the value of viewing a hypothesis set through the lens of a set of points x1 to xn. What is that value? It has immediately taken, for example, an uncountably infinite hypothesis set and sort of condensed it down in, into the set of dichotomies that that hypothesis set can implement on these points. Okay. It's saying that, you know, you might have as complicated a hypothesis set as you, as you want. I don't care. What I really care about is what can you do for me on these points? Okay. And if your hypothesis set is not only large but diverse, you'll be able to do all the two to the n dichotomies. Okay. If your hypothesis set is not diverse, it contains mostly the same functions, well, in that case, you might only be able to do two or three. Okay. And so, we can quantify the complexity, which includes the diversity of the hypothesis set. We can quantify the complexity of our hypothesis set with respect to, to this uh, set of points by the size of the dichotomy set. Okay. So we can quantify, we can quantify the complexity of H on X1 to Xn using the size of H of X1, X2 up to Xn. So the size of a, of, a, of a hypothesis set still plays a role, okay? But it is the size of the number of, if the effective number of functions you can implement on a set. And since there are at most two to the n dichotomies on x1 to xn, this is at most two to the n. Okay. It turns out that when viewed through the eyes of a set of points, this complexity is, it turns out that this complexity is essentially what we need to replace the size of the hypothesis set that we that we were using for the finite hypothesis case. So effectively what's happening is that an infinite hypothesis set, okay, when viewed through the eyes of a data set, and we'll always in practice have a data set in mind, okay, so a, a hypothesis set, no matter how complex and how infinite, when viewed through the, through the lens, when viewed, when, when restricted to a set of points, becomes finite. In fact, we can even give an upper bound, okay, on the size. Okay. So, I want to address two questions. Okay. Well, the first question is, hmm, well, this is all well and good. It's nice. You develop this cute way of, uh, of, of viewing a hypothesis set through the lens of a data set. Okay. But, you know, we don't know the data set in, that we're going to get in practice. Okay. So, but we need to pick our hypothesis set before we see the data set. Okay. And, um, and so what x1 to xn should we use for, for, for computing this complexity of a hypothesis set? That's the first question. That's the first question. So, question one. Okay, and I'll list the questions. Question one. What x1 to xn should we use to to, to compute the complexity of a hypothesis set. To compute the complexity of a hypothesis set. Okay, 
why is this an important question? Because we have to pick our hypothesis set ahead of time and we don't know what data points are going to pop up. For example, example, you know, we don't know the data and must fix H beforehand. Okay, so that's the first question. And then the second question is, yes, okay, so you've managed to, you know, reduce the infinite uh, complex hypothesis set to a finite set of dichotomies that are, that are relevant for the set of points x1 to xn, but, you know, and, and then we've managed to find a bound on that size of 2 to the n. Okay, so is that bound useful? Question 2. Is the bound, you know, h of x1 to xn, so this complexity, that's equal to 2 to the n, is it useful? Okay, so, you know, we're, we're going to answer these two questions. Okay, so let me erase. Um, ah, okay. So, um, no, let me, let, 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 let's answer both of these questions. Okay, we have a little bit of space here. Okay. So, question one, very easy to answer. Yes, we don't know which data points you may need to evaluate the complexity of a hypothesis set on. But that's, you know, we're computer scientists. We're familiar with this, with this sort of, uh, you know, method of algorithm analysis. You know, we build an algorithm, okay, and we don't know what input is coming. So what do we do? We analyze the algorithm in the worst case. Okay. And why not apply the same logic, the same philosophy here? We don't know what data set is coming and we would like to, you know, have, we would like to be equipped with a measure of complexity for my hypothesis set. So let's define not the complexity, not with respect to a specific x1 to xn, okay, but with respect to the worst possible x1 to xn. So we will define the complexity of H as the worst possible complexity, the worst possible size of the set of dichotomies when H is restricted to x1 to xn, where you can choose these x1 to xn adversarially. Okay, so we will use worst case analysis. Okay, and we will define, and, 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 and that is going to be the, uh, you know, that is going to be the final definition of a complexity of a hypothesis set when viewed through a data set of size n. Okay, so we will define m sub h of n. Why? Because n plays a role. n is the number of points with respect to which we are defining the complexity. So m sub h of n is equal to the max, the maximum possible complexity. It's the max over all possible choices of x1, x2, up to xn. It's the maximum of the complexity. Wow, worst case analysis. Let's prepare for the worst. Okay. So when we view a hypothesis set and we are asked, you, you know, what is the complexity of this hypothesis set with respect to a data set of size n, we're going to consider all possible data sets of size n, okay, and look at how many dichotomies this hypothesis set can implement, okay, and then take the maximum. So in words, okay, this is equal to the maximum number of dichotomies that H can implement on any data set of size n. Okay, so I'll underline the important words. Maximum number of dichotomies that H can implement on any data set of size n. Okay. Now, this is called the growth function. Okay. 
Okay, and it is going to be our, our effective measure of complexity. So you can think of it as an effective number of hypotheses. Okay, and you know, um, <coughs> since this guy, the, since the hypothesis set when restricted to n data points can implement at most two to the n dichotomies no matter what the data set, this maximum is also at most two to the n. Okay, and now we might be thinking, hmm, you know, if I have a complex hypothesis set with uncountably many hypotheses, then, you know, since I'm allowed to choose this data set, odds are that this bound is realizable, right? Odds are that I'll be able to find a particular set of uh, n points for which I can actually get to do the n dichotomies, okay? So, let's address the second question, which is, you know, is this bound on the effective complexity of a hypothesis set going to be useful? So question two. Okay. Is this bound going to be useful? Is this bound going to be useful? Hmm. Okay. So let's see where, where we are going with this. Where we're going with this is where we're trying to plug this bound, okay, well, well, we're trying to plug this, you know, effective complexity, we're trying to re replace this brute force size of H complexity with this effective complexity. So, let me show you the error bar, okay, where that, which is where this uh, size of the hypothesis set is relevant. So, in the finite hypothesis case, the error bar, okay, the error bar was, you know, and then the square root of 1 over 2n, the log, natural log of twice the hypothesis set size divided by delta. Now, of course, when we, when, we, when we do the full theory, it's not going to be this same error bar, but it has the same form. And our goal is to replace this size of h with this effective complexity m sub h of n. So let's imagine that, you know, we were able to do this and without having to change any constants. It turns out we have to change constants and so on and so forth. But, you know, heuristically, what I'd like to do is replace this guy, okay? I'd like to replace that guy with m sub h of n. Okay. And where now the n will actually be the data set size. Okay. It turns out that it's not, it's not going to be the data set size. It's, it's, it's going to be twice the data set size. But, you know, let's not worry about technicalities. Okay. And now, uh, let's evaluate this, uh, this uh, error bar when, you know, this effective complexity is 2 to the n. Okay. So let me put in here 2 to the n. Well, you know, forget about the constants and stuff like that. You know, the log of 2 to the n is going to, the n is going to come out of the log and it's going to cancel this n. And that n in the denominator here was absolutely instrumental in making this error bar shrink. Okay. And, 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 and rein in the out of sample error, making it approximately equal to the in sample error. Okay. So on face value, this doesn't look useful at all. Okay. We can ask, wh what kind of effective complexity would be useful? So anything that's polynomial in n would be useful. So instead of 2 to the n, if I had anything that's polynomial in n, so let's say I put here n to the power d, whatever I want, d. Okay. Now when I take the log, I get d times log n. Okay. So I get d times log n over n. Ah, but that's beautiful. Log n over n crushed to zero eventually. It's almost like 1 over n. Not quite like 1 over n, but almost like 1 over n. So, two conclusions. The 2 to the n, if, if I succeed in computing an error bar for the infinite hypothesis uh, setting where I can replace the size of the hypothesis with this effective size, okay, 2 to the n as, a, as, as that effective size is not going to help me in getting that error bar small. Okay, it's going to be almost as bad as, you know, infinite hypothesis set. Okay, but polynomial growth function will. Okay, so 2 to the n, this bound is of not much use. Okay, so we are going to have to address this issue and also address the issue of can we replace 
the, the, if the, the size of the hypothesis set with this effective size. We're going to have to address both of those issues. Okay. Um, and the first issue we're going to address is this two to the n. Okay. You know, can we, so is all of this discussion, you know, for naught? Because it will be for naught if, you know, for all hypothesis sets that we are interested in, you know, the, the effective complexity is 2 to the n. Okay, so let me erase the board. And what I want to do is I want to consider now some examples of infinite hypothesis sets. And let's just see if we can compute the growth functions to get a feeling for the growth function. Okay, and, that, and, 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 and that'll give, give us some intuition for what's going on with growth functions. And then, you know, I'm going to give you this combinatorial puzzle and it'll be... It'll look like out of the blue, but believe me, it's a very relevant combinatorial puzzle to the growth function. Okay, and that'll be the end of the lecture for today. Okay, so let's erase. Speed erase. Okay, so um, so since we've introduced this uh, new measure of complexity, before we go and prove things about it, you know, let's do some examples. Okay, so you know, and we're going to focus on now infinite hypothesis sets because you know that's where we're trying to go. So let's consider the perceptron in two dimensions. Okay, our favorite number of dimensions, our favorite hypothesis set, perceptron in two dimensions. Okay, so, you know, let's consider, you know, three points, okay, and x1, x2, x3, and I'm trying to indicate that these three points are on a line. Okay. So, you know, let's, let's, let's list the dichotomies, so what does a perceptron do? A perceptron places a line and separates, okay? So let's list the dichotomies that can be implemented. Well, you know, um, you know, so, you know, I can place the line so that it's somewhere here, so everything is plus. You know, I can place the line here so that this is minus and two plus. I can place the line here, somewhere here, so that this is two plus and minus. I can place it here so that, you know, everything is minus, um, but, so, so what are the dichotomies that I can implement? Let's see. I can implement um, plus, plus, plus. I put the line here. I can implement minus, plus, plus. I put the line here. Okay, I can imp and, and, and that side is plus. I can implement, you know, minus, minus, plus. Minus, minus, plus, if I put the line here. Okay, I can implement uh, minus, minus, minus. Okay. And is that it? No, because those were all the perceptrons which were plus in that direction. What about if it was minus in that direction and plus in this direction? Okay, so if I put the line here and it's minus in that direction, that's minus, minus, minus. I already have that. If I put the line here, minus in that direction, I get plus, minus, minus. If I put the line here with minus in that direction, I get plus, plus, minus. If I put the line here with minus in that direction, okay, it's uh, minus, minus, minus. And you will observe, hmm. Very nice. Okay, that now I have one, two, three, four, five, six dichotomies that I can implement. What am I missing? Okay, what I'm missing are um, uh, minus plus minus. So I'm missing, I don't have, um, let me put it in red, I don't have, you know, minus plus minus, and I don't have plus uh, minus plus. Okay, so what about these guys? Let me show you what that looks like. Minus, plus, minus. Okay. This that card. Mm. Okay, well, how am I going to put the line to get this dichotomy? So, you know, let's say I do this and I and I need, so if, if the minus is under here, then I need to somehow turn the line and get that minus under the line, but once I get close enough to that point, this blue starts getting classified as minus. So I cannot implement. Okay. So these cannot be implemented. Okay, that's fine. 
So that just means that h of x1, x2, x3, so h of x1, x2, x3 in psi, so the complexity of the perceptron hypothesis set for this set of points is 6. Okay. Now I'm going to take you back to the, the worst case analysis that we talked about. We didn't define this as the true complexity of h with respect to data sets of size 3. Okay, because with respect to data sets of size, size 3, I get to choose the data set. Okay, and I must choose the data set to make this size as large as possible. And I, I very, you know, cheekily chose these three points specifically to illustrate that if you choose the points badly, you won't be able to implement as many dichotomies as you think you should, because it seems like we should be able to implement eight dichotomies. Remember that bound two to the n? Okay, so, you know, let's change the points and see if we can do better. And indeed, look, if I place the points like this, okay, now plus 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 I just put the line here, minus plus plus I put the line here, minus 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 I put, uh, I put uh, minus minus plus I put the line here with that side being minus, minus 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 I can just put the line here with that side being minus. Okay, plus minus minus, so plus minus minus I put the line here with that side being minus. That side is minus, okay? Uh, plus, 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 uh, sorry, plus, plus, minus, so plus, plus, minus, put the line here with that side being plus. Okay, now, but the, here are the interesting ones. Minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, all I did was, rem all I did was move this point that was on the line, I moved it down, but now look, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so this guy, minus, minus, and that's plus. No problem, put the line here. So making those points collinear was a bad idea. Okay. Now, indeed, I can implement, um, you know, minus plus minus and plus minus plus. So I can implement them. I can do uh, minus plus minus and plus minus plus. And so now I have eight dichotomies. And I know I cannot do more because there are at most eight dichotomies. So M sub H of three. The maximum number of dichotomies that I can do, if I'm allowed to choose the points to try to maximize, is indeed 8. And remember, we had that bound 2 to the n. Nice. Okay, the bound is working. And indeed, and indeed, this hypothesis set we might have guessed. It's such a complicated hypothesis set. If you allow me to choose the, the points, I'm going to be able to implement all 8 dichotomies because I mean, I've got infinitely many hypotheses to choose from. Okay, so let's do another example. Da, 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 da. Okay, same two dimensional perceptron. Let's increase to n equals four. So n equals four. One, two. Now we know we shouldn't choose the points to be in a line, so let's choose them, you know, somehow randomly. Okay. And remember, so now I'm going to jump straight. Remember that when we had three points, the, the dichotomy that was hard for us to implement was that sort of alternating dichotomy, minus, plus, minus. So let me jump straight and see if I can implement the alternating dichotomy here. Because if I can implement that alternating dichotomy here, odds are I can implement all the other ones. Okay. So let's go for the alternating dichotomy. My, uh, plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so these two guys are minus. Sometimes this is called the XOR type of dichotomy. Forget about, you know, what we call it. Okay, it's alternating. Uh, challenge. You figure out the perceptron that implements this. So figure out a line that separates the plus points from the minus points. Okay, so this is the dichotomy, you know, uh, plus, minus, plus, minus. If I label these points X1, X2, X3, X4. It cannot be done. Okay, because... If I try to get these two as plus, so I need to put my line somewhere here, okay, with that side as plus, you're going to get that point also as plus. Or if I put my line here with that side as plus, I'm going to get that point also as plus. You cannot implement. You cannot implement. Okay, and what about the, 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 the flipped one where it's, it's, it's alternating but starting with minus plus, minus plus. So minus plus, minus plus. You cannot do that either. So this one you cannot do. This one you cannot do. Okay. Now you might think, well, you know, did I choose the point specially? So now this is a challenge for you. Go, try, try to find four points. And, and I, I claim that this is, the, this, is the, the, this is, for this arrangement of points, is the arrangement for which you can do the most. Okay. And you cannot do these two. Just cannot. Okay. And it doesn't matter how you arrange the points. So, so this means that for the perceptron, 
m sub h of uh, 4 is equal to 14. And that is less than 2 to the n. Ah, there is hope. Remember, we said that, you know, 2 to the n is not so useful in the bound. Okay? But we have some hope now that, you know, for, even for an infinite hypothesis set, okay, in some sense, this infinite hypothesis set, which is the perceptron, from the perspective of complexity, it's not that complex as we thought. Because look, four points can reveal a deficiency. Okay, four points alone reveal a deficiency. So what this means is that no matter where you place your four points, you're not going to be able to implement more than 14 dichotomies, which is less than that upper bound, which we already argued this upper bound of 2 to the n is not going to be much use to us, but there is hope. So sir, it looks like at least hope for the perceptron okay, that its, its, its effective complexity is not as bad as it could have been. It's much better. Okay. Let's consider another example. Um, the one-dimensional positive ray. Okay, so I'll tell you what the hypothesis looks like. So we're in one dimension, okay, and the hypothesis, so h of x, the hypothesis in this set is of the form sine of x minus w0. So it's similar to a perceptron, except that a, the perceptron would have had, you know, w1x, you know, plus w0. This is, you can think of this as, I set w1 to 1, and, you know, the, the fact that this is minus w0 is just convenient. Okay, it could have been plus w0. Okay. But this has the interpretation that you pick a threshold, w0, and on the right of the threshold, you are plus 1, and on the left, you are minus 1. Okay, so that's why we call it the positive rate. Okay. So let's place some points. And this time, we're going to go all out. I'm not going to consider 3 or 4. We're going to go all out and place n points. Okay, so n points. Okay, so think of this as x1, x2, x3, x4, da, 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 xn. Okay. Now, in this example, I've placed w0 here. Okay, and so what that accomplishes is everything, all the points on the right here are getting are classified as plus. Okay, and all the points on the left are getting classified as minus. Okay. And it, it, it should be sort of, with a, with a little bit of thought, you should be able to convince yourself that, you know, all I can do is change the position of the threshold, and that'll change how many of the points get plus by defining how many are on the right of the threshold. And effectively, there are only, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on, uh, different regions in which I can place the threshold. If I have n points, there are actually n plus 1 regions. So here I get all plus. Here I get all minus, and then I can get some combination of left red and right uh, uh, blue by placing the threshold in these intervals. Okay, but since there are only n plus one different, uh, since there are only effectively n plus one useful positions for this w zero, there are effectively only n plus one different di hypotheses in this uncountably infinite hypothesis set. Okay. So in this case, we can explicitly count the number of dichotomies that can be implemented. Okay. And, you know, uh, the number of dichotomies that can be implemented. So the, and, and, and you cannot get a better arrangement of points to increase that number of dichotomies. So the max number of dichotomies is, you know, equal to the number of different regions where I can place W0 is the number of different regions where I can place W0, and that's equal to n plus 1. So m sub h of n is equal to n plus 1. So let's compute, you know, when n equals, you know, so let's do n here, and m sub h of n. Okay, so when n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So m sub h of n is n plus 1, so it's 2, okay? And 2 is the same as 2 to the 1, so it accomplishes the bound that we had before. But now, the moment I get to 2 here, n plus 1 is 3, and it's already less than 2 to the 2. Okay, 2 to the 2, which is 2 to the n. Okay. And here we have 4, here we have 5, and so on. Let me just write here 2 to the n, which is, remember, this trivial bound is 2, 4, 8, um, 
16. Okay. And now you can see, ah, there's a lot of hope for this hypothesis set in one dimension. Even though it's uncountably infinite, it's not as diverse as it looks. Because on a data set of size 4, it can only implement five dichotomies. Only implement five dichotomies. When in theory, if it were really that complicated, it should have been able to implement 16 dichotomies. So this is just to show you that this measure of complexity, this effective number of hypotheses, is quite beautiful. It's a, it's a, it's, it, it's a very imaginative step in, in analyzing the, the sort of complexity of a hypothesis set when what you care about is a data set. That even though in, in the most complex hypothesis on set on, on four data points should be able to implement 16, this guy can only implement five, which is much less now than two to the n. So there is hope okay, that this measure of complexity will be useful when we plug it into the bound. Okay, so I want to show you, I want to illustrate you know, two things here. So in this case, we could compute m sub h of n, you know, exactly. In this case, we computed it sort of by hand. Again, okay? we showed that it's, it's, it's eight, so m sub h of 3 in this case was 8, which is equal to 2 to the n. So let's put that same table. So you know, when you have n and m sub h of n. So it turns out that if you have two points, or if you have one point, you can implement both dichotomies. If you have two points, you can implement both dichotomies. If you have three points, you can implement both dichotomies. I mean, all eight dichotomies, if, if you suitably place them. But if you have four points, you 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 you, you can only implement 14 dichotomies, okay? And if I put here 2 to the n for comparison, this is 2, this is 4, this is 8, this is 16, okay? So I will put this in red here, da, 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 to show that, ah, there's hope in this hypothesis set. It's not as complex as the most complex diverse hypothesis set could be. And we say that this hypothesis set gets broken we, we see its deficiency at n equals 4. And this hypothesis set gets broken at n equals 2. Okay. This hypothesis set gets broken at n equals 2. So in some sense, you might think, well, you know, this, this hypothesis set keeps chugging along, so it seems a little bit more complex. Okay, and only gets broken at n equals 4. This hypothesis set gets broken at n equals 2. So in some sense, you know, this seems like a less complicated, less less diverse hypothesis set than this. Okay. So I, I, let me consider one more example. So in this case, we can so, so, sort of, we've computed it. Okay, and we might ask, you know, what about n equals four? Uh, sorry, what about n equals five, question mark? Okay, the maximum we know is 32, but what is it? Well, we can go ahead and compute it. And if you want an interesting combinatorial exercise, try to compute the number of dichotomies that the perceptron can implement on five data points, where you get to choose the data points you know, so as to maximize that number. Okay, here we computed it exactly. And in some cases, it's hard to compute exactly, but we can show this situation does occur in some cases, okay? So it's hard to compute the exact value. Here we computed the exact value is 14, okay? Um, and uh, the exact value is 14, no problem. Um, and we see that it's broken, okay? But in this case, it's hard to compute the exact value. I can tell you for sure that it is less than 32. Okay, I can tell you for sure that it is less than 32. And you might try to think, what's the argument to, to show that it has to be less than 32? And it has to do with the fact that on 16 points, you can only do 14. I'm sorry, on four points, you can only do 14. Okay, let's do another example. Uh, so two dimensions. Uh, positive axis align rectangle. Okay, now rather than give you a, so in this case, the, the h of x is equal to the sine of, you know, w transpose x, where you have w0, w1, w2. Here there's only a w0 because it's a, it's just a positive ray. Rather than give you a formula for h of x, let me just illustrate. Okay, so you know, we're in two dimensions. And remember now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dig into the, what, what, what does a hypothesis do? What does a classifier do? It separates the region into plus and minus. And so what we mean here is that you have an axis aligned rectangle and you can place this anywhere you want with, with any height and width. Okay. And inside the rectangle, it has to be plus and outside the rectangle is going to be minus. 
So this is one. So, and all possible hypotheses of this kind belong to this hypothesis set. Again, uncountably many, because you get to choose, for example, you know, you get to choose the, uh, the, the bottom left vertex. So there are two values, x, y for the bottom and the top right vertex, uh, x, y. So you get to choose four real parameters and that defines the rectangle. Okay. And inside the rectangle is plus one and outside the rectangle is minus one. Okay. So again, let's consider some points. Let's con now let's jump, you know, so four points uh, sort of broke this hypothesis set. Three point, two points broke this hypothesis set. Let's see if four points can break that hypothesis set. So let's place four points, you know, in, 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 in two dimensional space. So one, two, three, four. Okay, now I claim that you give me a dichotomy, any dichotomy you want. So this is a kind of a game I can play to show you that I can implement all the dichotomies. Give me any dichotomy you want and I can implement it. So let's think of the dichotomy that broke, um, let's think of the dichotomy that broke this guy, the alternating dichotomy. Okay, so the alternating dichotomy looks something like this, plus, plus, minus, minus. And I claim no problem. I'll just put my positive rectangle like this. Okay. And I've implemented it. No problem. Okay. And you can, you can arrange any three, you know, plus points and, and cover it with a rectangle. You can arrange any one plus point and cover it with a rectangle that's just on top of it. All four plus points you can cover with a rectangle. And then if there are no plus points, you just put your positive rectangle outside. Okay, so we can implement any dichotomy. So all for these four points, four points can implement any dichotomy. Okay, so therefore for these four points, you know, the effective size of the hypothesis set, in other words, the number of dichotomies you can implement is 16. And since you can never get more than 16, that means that M sub H of four is equal to 16. Okay, nice. Okay. So this hypothesis set looks like it's not broken, it's not deficient, it, it's as complex as it could appear for a set of 14 uh, points. Okay. What about five points for a set of four points? Sorry. What about five points? Mm. Okay, so now let's add a point. So let's take my four points. Okay, so let's take my four points and now let's add a point. So where do we want to add the point? Ah, I don't know. That's, you know, it has to be either inside these or outside. What do you want? It doesn't matter. It can be either inside or outside. Okay, so let's, let's imagine the case where it's outside because that looks safer. Okay. So here's a case where it's outside. Okay. And, you know, uh, what I'm going to do, because it's outside, I can see, okay, so, okay, so where did I put it? Did I put it below this point or above this point? If I put it below this point, okay, so let's imagine that it's below this point. It could be above, then the argument is, 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 is exactly the same, okay? So you might think, so, so, so figure out what the argument is going to be if it's above this point, but let's say it's below this point. So now I'm going to consider these three points, okay? And I'm going to consider the dichotomy which is plus, plus, minus. Okay. And I don't care what you pick on those. Okay. Why do I not care? Because look, if, you know, any positive rectangle is going to include these two points, okay, then it's, it's you know, it's, it's top and bottom must sort of its its top and bottom, its top edge and its bottom edge must be on, uh, its, its top edge must be above this point and its bottom edge must be above this point. Okay, so its top edge is somewhere here and its bottom edge has to be somewhere here. And now we can look at the left and right edges. The left edge must be somewhere on this side and its right edge must be somewhere up to the right of that point. Okay, but now we have a problem because any positive rectangle that's going to get these two correct is going to mess up that guy. Okay. And in fact, you know, you can show that whenever you have five points, there will always be a point 
that's inside the rectangle defined by two other points. And then you can construct a counterexample like this okay, that cannot be implemented. And so what I'm just proving here is that, you know, with five points, five points, so theorem, if you want to call it a theorem, with five points, there is always a dichotomy that cannot be implemented. Mm. Okay. Now, the specific dichotomy that cannot be implemented depends on the five points, but what I know for sure is that with five points, there is always a dichotomy that cannot be implemented. Now, I'm going to ask you to go and formally prove that you know, on your own time. Take it for granted from me, you know, and, and maybe we'll assign it as an exercise okay, for the homework. Okay. So, that tells me that, you know, M, so the maximum number of dichotomies sub H for this positive axis aligned rectangle when you had four points was equal to 16. M sub H of five points, well, we don't know what it is. Okay. But what I do know is that no matter how you choose the five points, you won't be able to implement all 32 dichotomies. So what I know is that this is less than 32. Ah, okay, so it turns out that if I did the same table with n going from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So if I do m sub h of n, you can easily convince yourself that it's 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, 16 we just showed. Okay, Fit m sub h of 5, we don't know. We don't know m sub h of 5. What we do know is that it is less than 32. Now, in, in, in practice, you could, if you wanted to, you could actually compute m sub h of 5. Okay? And if you feel like it, go for it. Okay? So I'll put this in red. Okay? And just for comparison, let me show you 2 to the n. 2 to the n. It's 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. Okay? And here it would be 64. Okay? Now, here we don't know what it is, but we do know that it is less than 32. So again, hope, even though this is an infinite hypothesis set, it doesn't realize all that complexity on five points that it could have. It could have implemented 32 dichotomies. And among infinitely many hypotheses, we just couldn't find a way to implement all 32 dichotomies. Okay, and here it will definitely be less than 64. So we know that it's going to be broken there as well. It's going to look broken. This hypothesis set has gotten broken, has gotten deficient. Four data points is not sufficient to reveal a deficiency, but five is. Two data points enough to reveal a deficiency. Four data points enough to reveal a deficiency. So, so two things to take away. First, infinite hypothesis sets even though they have uncountably many hypotheses, do not reveal the full range of diversity that is possible when viewed through the lens of points, of data points. Because four data points, you should be able to do 16 if you could do anything, but you cannot. You can only do 14. So infinite hypothesis sets do not attain this most complex, uh, uh, diverse upper bound on the number of dichotomies that they could have. Okay, so there is hope for the bound. And the second thing to notice is that, you know, hypothesis sets get broken, okay, and we can compute this measure of complexity, but it looks like a very challenging measure of complexity to compute. And it would be nice if we could, could get some formulas or something like that. Okay, and in some cases, we don't even compute it. We just show that, you know, the, the hypothesis set is broken. Okay, so it would be nice to have a formula or at least an upper bound okay, that could tell us, you know, how complex is this hypothesis set? How effectively complex is this hypothesis set? Now, we may not be able to compute its true complexity, like the size of the hypothesis set in, a fi in the finite case, but we might be able to compute its effective, complex its effective complexity, i.e., we might be able to compute an upper bound. And for, with respect to that, uh, that error bar, you know, we have upper bounding E out. So if we can get an upper bound on the complexity, then that's just as good 
for the for the error bar. We can plug that into the error bar. Okay. So let me give you the combinatorial puzzle next. Um, speed erase. Okay, so let's end this uh, lecture on uh, an important useful definition. I'll give you a couple of exercises so you can you know, get familiar with this new notion of complexity, this effective number of hypotheses, this growth function, and then I'll uh, end with a combinatorial puzzle for you to you know, grind your teeth on. Okay, definition to shatter. Okay, so remember that you know, if you have data points x1 to xn, uh, x, so points x1, x2 up to xn. Remember that you know a dichotomy assigns plus or minus to each point. So there's plus, minus. Let's say here's an example dichotomy, and we know that there are you know two to the n different dichotomies. Okay. Now you have a hypothesis set H, and you know. Uh, this hypothesis set consists of hypotheses and each hypothesis in, uh, induces a dichotomy and we will say that H shatters So H shatters the points if you know H can implement all these dichotomies all these two to the n dichotomies on this set of points x1 to xn so H shatters x1 to xn if you know H implements all two to the n dichotomies on x1 to xn. Okay, so that's the definition of shadow. It's not. It's nothing new. I just. It's useful to have a term for the situation where uh, a hypothesis set can implement all possible dichotomies on a particular set of points, and and that means that with respect to those points, this hypothesis set is effectively as complex as you can get. Okay, now here are some exercises. So exercises. One. Okay, supposing you have this hypothesis set and you have n points. So you have n points x1, x2, up to xn. So this is a specific set of n points uh, that are, are shattered by h. Then show that m sub h of n is equal to 2 to the n. Okay. So you know, this is nothing more than sort of carefully looking back at the definition of this growth of this growth function. This just says that H shatters a particular set of n points. In which case, uh, show that its growth function is two to the n. Okay, two. Suppose you have a hypothesis set in some space, and suppose that m sub H of n is strictly less than two to the n. Okay, then show that there's no set of endpoints is no set of endpoints x1 up to xn that are shattered by h okay so this is to show that you know if 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 if, if, if the complexity measure for this hypothesis set is less than 2 to the n. So, in other words, it's not as complex as possible for sets of endpoints. It means that there's no set of endpoints that are shattered. And again, this is just, you know, carefully parse and understand the definition of this growth function. Okay. Now, third exercise, a little bit less trivial, but still, you should be able to do it. No problem. Okay. So, three. Suppose uh, m sub h of uh, k is less than 2 to the k. So this means that, you know, if, if you've shown this, it means that there's no set of points of size k which can be shattered by h. Okay. Then show that for any larger number of points, you cannot find a set of points that's shattered. So then show that m sub h of n is less than 2 to the n for all um, n greater equal to k. So in other words, if you find a, a, a value k 
So a number of data points K, which breaks a hypothesis set. In other words, this hypothesis set is deficient with respect to that number of points. What that means is that, you know, no matter how you choose those K points, the hypothesis set is not as complex as possible. You cannot implement all two to the K dichotomies. So if you've broken a hypothesis set at some value of K, at some number of data points, if K data points breaks the hypothesis set, then any larger number of data points will also break the hypothesis set and reveal its deficiencies. Okay, so think about these exercises. It'll help you sort of get more familiar with this brand new notion of the effective number of hypotheses, the complexity of a hypothesis set when viewed through the lens of a data set. Okay, and now for the combinatorial puzzle. Com B na to re al puzzle. Okay, and you know it's 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 it is a combinatorial puzzle, but I'll sort of phrase it in a way that you know makes it look familiar at least with respect to this whole language of dichotomies. Okay. So imagine I have three data points: x one, x two, x three. Okay, and remember, a dichotomy assigns plus or minus to the data, data point. I'll, I'll use a visual representation of plus or minus that just, just makes it easier to sort of look at this picture. So here are, I'm classifying plus or minus for these data points, and here's how it's going to go. The empty data point is minus, and the filled data point is plus. So I'm going to say that this is minus, 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 plus. So I'll fill in plus, minus, plus, minus. So I'll fill in the plus. Okay. And... Uh, uh, minus plus plus. So I'll fill in plus, and I'll fill in plus. Okay, so fine. Think of this as four dichotomies on, on these three points. If I wanted to, I could list out all eight. Okay, and if I listed out all eight, that those, those eight dichotomies would basically, we would say that they shatter these points. Okay? But four dichotomies cannot shatter these points because you're not going to get all eight ways to to classify these points from just think of these as four hypotheses, but I'm just being more general. I'm just considering any dichotomies. Okay. Now, I want to point out, I want to sort of uh, zoom in on these two data points, x2, x3. So let's zoom in here. Okay. Now observe that we have four dichotomies on x2, x3, and look, they're all different. Minus, 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 plus, plus, minus, plus, plus. They're all different. So we've managed, so these three dichotomies have managed to implement, so when you just, just, when you just view them restricted to these two data points, they have managed to implement all the four possible dichotomies on these two data points. So what we will say is that these four dichotomies shatter these two points. Okay. So these four dichotomies shatter x1, x2. And we don't care what they're doing on, sorry, shadow x2, x3. And we don't care what they're doing on x1. Okay. Well, I'm going to say that, you know, if a pair of points is shattered, you know, I don't like that. So I would like to find four dichotomies such that when you, when you zoom in on any pair of points, when you zoom in on any two points, you will not find all four, um, you will not find all four uh, possible dichotomies for those two points. So in other words, no pair of points is shattered by my four dichotomies. And here we go. X1, X2, X3. So, you know, I'll use the same visual notation. And look, if I put minus, 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 if I do minus, minus, plus, uh, minus, plus, minus, and then plus, minus, minus. Okay. Now, Consider any pair of points, let's say x1, x2. Well, if I consider x1, x2, I have minus, 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 minus. So minus, minus is repeated. So there are only three different dichotomies if I'm only looking at x1, x2. So x1, x2 is not shattered. What about x2, x3? x2, x3 has minus, 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 minus. Okay, so x2, x3 is not shattered. What about x1, x3? Look at x1, x3, minus, minus, uh, minus, minus. So x1, x3 is not shattered. There are only three different dichotomies that can be found when you, just restrict, when you just restrict yourself to any pair of points. And notice that all these dichotomies are distinct, yet they cannot shatter any pair of points. So these four, so these four dichotomies uh, do not shatter any two points. 
Okay. And now the question is, can you add, can you make this list longer? Is there a longer list of different distinct dichotomies with which, which continue to have this property that no pair of points is shattered? Okay. Now you can work hard and try to see if you can find any five dichotomies for which no two points are shattered. You won't find it. So the answer is this is the maximum number of dichotomies that I could list, maximum number of distinct dichotomies that I could list for which no pair of points is shattered. Is shattered. So this 4 is the max. Okay, I cannot list more. Okay, but that's not the combinatorial puzzle. The combinatorial puzzle is to go up to 5, uh, sorry, to go up to uh, 4 points. So suppose now we had 4 points x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay, well, you know, let's, uh, let me show you. You know, I can list the economies in the same way. Okay, 1, 2, 3, you know, whatever you want, dot, dot, dot. So you list the economies. For example, I, make, I can make this plus. Now I need a different dichotomy here. So maybe I'll make this plus and this plus. And maybe I'll make, uh, you know, these three plus. Okay. So I have a lot of flexibility now in how to pick my dichotomies because when there are four points, I have 16 dichotomies to choose from. The question is, what's the largest list I can uh, come up with? Okay, but I, but I need to maintain the constraint that no pair of points is shattered. Okay. No pair of points is shattered. And that's a constraint, and that's what it's going to reduce me from 16 to something much less. The question is, what's the maximum you can find? Can you find 9? Can you find 8? Can you find 7? Can you find 6? Can you find 5? Okay. Okay, so what's the maximum you can find? What is the max you can find? So you can pause the video and try to find this. If you pause the video, you know, I'll give you a second. If you pause the video, great. And if, if you answer that, you can find 5. Well, you've, you've managed, you know, you've managed to match, um, you've managed to match me. Okay, if you can find six, you've managed to beat me. Okay, and, uh, you know, so think, so, so try to see, try to see what's the max that you can find. And uh, we'll see you next time. So, ciao.